Aloha, Dave Lawrence, and member-supported Hawaii Public Radio. It's all things considered, and uh, another one of these uh, very special moments here in town. Uh, we're lucky that we've had uh, just a few artists so far at the Blue Note Hawaii. It's in Waikiki, uh, and the latest artist here is here through Sunday. It is Roberta Gambarini. How am I saying that? You're doing great. Perfect. <laughs> Roberta Gambarini. <laughs> Roberta Gambarini. It's just fun to say. Italian jazz singer from Turin. Is that how you pronounce it? Torino. But I, I've been living in New York for a long time now. So. How? Explain that to me. It's Torino. It's Turin. What's the... Uh, Torino is the Italian name. Turin. It's an English name. And it's in the northwest near the Alps. On the other side, there's France. Okay. And I know that you've been in, uh, in the United States for a while, living in New York. Uh, and uh, Connecting Spirits, latest record, Jimmy and Tootie Heath. Yeah, this was a project that... Um, I wanted to have been wanting to do this project for a long time. I started working with Jimmy Heath many, many years ago, about eight, 17 years ago, as soon as I moved to New York. I met him at the Thelonious Monk competition. And uh, later we toured together as part of the Dizzy Gillespie All Stars Big Band. And uh, I've been admiring, of course, his playing, his arranging skills, uh, and, uh, and his compositional skills. But I didn't know that he had such a great vocal production that never got the chance to be heard or recorded much. So um, we picked a bunch of songs from his vocal production. Some of those songs have lyrics from Jimmy, uh, by Jimmy himself, and others were just instrumental, so I wrote the lyrics to some of those. You've been credited with uh, having a really uh, intense talent and um one of the things, Roberto, getting to do this job, it's an uh, it's afternoon radio show, it's an afternoon drive, and there's all these different kinds of cats who would be on there, and some of them be rock, and some will be jazz, and there'll be blues, uh, all different folks, and uh, it's almost like a little uh, study over the years of doing interviews. I've come to realize that the early childhood development of folks really seems to make a big difference, and you hear a lot about that today in society with trying to help kids, and it seems... Like, it's a really big deal. And I just recently made this connection after talking to a lot of different cats recently. And I see that when they were really, really young, uh, critical things happened that brought the music into their lives. And then all these years later, like yourself, you're, you're able to embody a career out of it. And I understand, and I'm hoping you can paint the picture for us a little better, that uh, it was your father's record collection that played a key role in his own musicianship in your development. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if there is a, a poster girl for <laughs> early exposure to music, that would be me. Because uh, my parents, both, both my parents are big jazz fans. They used to also um, volunteer at a jazz club in northern Italy. So they not only had a really nice record collection, mostly vinyls at the time, but also they used to take me with them when I was very small to hear music in this jazz club just because, you know, they knew the owners. It was almost like a family thing. Was, but, it, but this small jazz club in the city of Biella was part of a, a network north of Torino, of a network of, uh, of clubs where uh, a lot of greats used to come and play. So I saw Dexter Gordon, uh, while you were a little girl. Seems, yeah, yeah, he gave me candy, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> He's this big, tall guy. And uh, yeah, I got to see them up close. And um, yeah, the first uh, type of music I listened to was jazz from the recording of my parents. So. Was there more in your dad's collection? Uh, yeah, my dad and mom, they both are big fans. And uh, there was an abundance of big band music, especially Count Basie. Count Basie was my dad's favorite, but also Duke, uh, Chick Webb, uh, uh, Jimmy Lunsford. You know, he was really very fond. Of. He used to play tenor saxophone when he was young. And they had a little jazz band called the Turin Boys. <laughs> it cracks me up. Your papa. My mio papa, see. Si. And uh, he used to play tenor saxophone, and his idol was Don Bias and Coleman Hawkins, but especially Don Bias. So I grew up listening to, to all these greats, especially, I have to say, tenor saxophone players. The voice of the, of the tenor is something that is kind of almost in, uh, in my early memory. It's kind of engraved in me. I really have a feeling for the voice of the, of the tenor saxophone. 
And we'll talk about that a little more relating to some of the projects you've done. Mom's favorites, too. Was it also jazz? And was there any rock and roll and things besides jazz? There was classical music because my mother was a seamstress. And so we, at the time, we had the cable radio. And on some channels, it was an entire channel dedicated to jazz 24 hours and another dedicated to classical. So for a change, she would switch on the classical, (coughs) put on the classical music. So it would be that. And... um, it would be also Latin music, Brazilian music, a lot of Brazilian music, South American music, uh, some pop, yeah, but, you know, Italian pop mostly. Uh, so they weren't into rock and roll, really? Not really. No, no, not rock and roll. Um, I got a little bit into rock and roll then in school, you know, through my my friends and everything. But I was mostly into Motown and soul then you know hard rock so so who were some of those singers then that uh maybe helped shape this vocal career of yours uh well first of all the jazz singers but also the classical and the and the and some of the soul singers for the for jazz the first voice i listened to was ella fitzgerald and louis armstrong and then you know sarah vaughn carmen mccray you know the the holy trinity (laughs) and many 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 more because i used to love for jazz, um, for um, classical, uh, the great voices, you know, Calla, Stebaldi, uh, you know, all the, the great singers. I, I love opera too, Leontine Price. You know. And um, for, um, so um, I would say Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, mm-hmm. Sam Cooke, I love those voices. And Aretha, of course, Aretha Franklin. I love gospel too. I listen to a lot of gospel and blues too. Yeah, I love blues. You um, got a little bit of experience in radio and TV. Was that prior to getting to live in Boston? Yes, it was. I was very little. (laughs) And uh, I was part of a vocal group that's called the Italian Vocal Ensemble. (laughs) And yeah, we ended up doing a lot of uh, stuff on the TV, on the radio. Like live radio performances? Is that a... Yeah, yeah. A lot of live radio performances. The third channel of radio was... um, um, a lot dedicated to both classical chamber and jazz and so they would broadcast from the festivals and uh, yeah in, in Italy you're saying that these are like state radio yes yes Ra- uh, radio the third channel of state radio yeah so um, I got to go to school at Emerson uh, and I was just around the corner from New England Conservatory uh, and so you had a real Is that your first uh, experience living abroad? Can you explain how you ended up at this prestigious music school? Uh, Okay, I didn't stay there for long, I have to say. But uh, um, when I was playing at a festival in northern Italy, in Valtellina, north of Milano, I met uh, Dominique Eid, who's a wonderful singer, and her husband, Alan Chase. They were there to promote and to do auditions for um, the promote the um, jazz program at New England Conservatory. And she uh, told me about the scholarship, the artist diploma, who um, she thought that she thought I was a, a suitable candidate for. So it was a little, there was a little competition. I sent a tape, and then I had to go there and do an audition, a live audition, which was a small set. Uh, and I was lucky because they, they picked me, and it was a very interesting program, two years of uh, <laughs> free private tuition, whatever I wanted to do. Then I was also teaching a couple of ensemble classes, and uh, and that was interesting. However, um, right after I moved to the U.S., maybe a week after, I I did the semifinals of the Thelonious Monk vocal competition in D.C. And uh, I met a lot of greats. Jimmy Heath, who gave me my first uh, concert in New York at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, I'll never forget it, in Harlem. And uh, it was a tribute to the great trumpeter Kenny Durham. Uh, So I met a lot of uh, great musicians and I got um, some interesting offers to come to New York and play. And so after that gig with with Jimmy Heath, uh, I, I got to play a lot with the great Billy Higgins. And I did, uh, at that time, there was a club, the Jazz Standard, which now is one of the major clubs in the city, but it was just opened at the time. So we did a lot of gigs there. I even got to play with Ron Carter, uh, Ronnie Matthews, the great Harold Land, oh my God, Curtis Fuller, and so many opportunities. And so um, I was um, 
kind of my focus became more New York than Boston. And so I had to make a choice because I couldn't go back and forth, back and forth. And so I ended up choosing New York. <laughs> it's a jump in the jump in, in the pan. So was it just a few weeks, literally, and then you were out of there because of this winning this? It was maybe a couple of months. <laughs> That's quick. Yeah. That's quick. So not a whole lot of time. Uh, in, in time. Not a whole lot of time. So I didn't get to enjoy uh, Boston that much. You play regatta bar, scholars. Which one do you play the most? Uh, scholars. Yeah, I love scholars, and I love uh, Freddie Taylor. He's the man. <laughs> yeah, I know so much history, and he's such a wonderful person. I love that club. Yeah. I used to live in that neighborhood. I used to. He used to put me on the list all the time for for stuff. Um, the uh, we were talking about it a little earlier. Your love for uh, for tenor sax, and there's a the Easy to Love album. Uh, it's the one where you sung the dizzy material, and you sung horn solos by trumpeter dizzy as well as tenor sax artists right uh sunny stitt sunny rollins can, can you for folks who are not as savvy about music as you and to try to explain it and let other people into what that entails explain you doing that with your voice well the first thing is that the original musical instrument is the human voice so i'm naming just one artist that you know, a lot of people who are not heavily into jazz will know, like Louis Armstrong, for example. The, the whole intent and the, the, the modulation of the instrumental sound is after the human voice. So these great instrumentalists were literally hollering, screaming, crying, saying things with their horns. And at the same time, in uh, jazz music, the singers who at the beginning played with these great instrumentalists I would say starting with uh, probably Bessie Smith, who had a great brassy sound, they started to mm, live almost in symbiosis with the instrumental sound, especially the brass. And so there's always been in jazz music this kind of uh, osmosis between, it's like the instrumentalists want to sound like singers, and the singers have a great feeling, not want to sound, but they have a great feeling for the, for the reed, for the brass, for the instrumental sound. Also because, especially at the beginning, singers were inserted as part of ensembles with a lot of horns, like big bands and everything. So there was there always been this fascinating uh, symbiosis. And so we have the, the great singers, I would say even, even blues singers, like Bessie Smith sounds like, a, like an instrument to me, always, always. But, uh, so this is a strong thing in jazz, you know, the vocalist is, uh, is, uh, is really almost like, a, it's, it's part vocalist and part instrumentalist, so, which means that a vocalist plays with her voice, uh, uh, can go places with her voice that uh, improvisation, yeah, of course. Um, and improvisation, anyway, is always a um, byproduct of the story that's told by the lyric. So but I get what your point is. Your voice is also, it can be like a hybrid between sounding like a voice and sounding like other things. It's like a tool yes. that can do a lot. Yes, it can do a lot. And, and that's what gives, uh, gives us this freedom. So, yeah. yeah. You scat, too, so much. I mean, it's so interesting yeah. to listen to how you pull that off. Yeah, I love to scat, and there again, we'll go back to Louis Armstrong, the right. father of it. But it's because uh, um, you get the free, it's like after the, the theme with the words come in and you tell a story, then you get to a point where you can say things that words cannot say. <laughs> That's the point. And you use the, uh, the elements of the music, especially the rhythm. In a way, we can say that rappers today are... Um, are like scat singers that only use rhythm you know they don't use the other elements that we use melody and, and harmony but some of the great great really great uh, rappers are amazing are really amazing are like you know their rhythm is like is like a great jazz singer yeah do you do any rap Roberta I, I don't but I love it yeah I love Kendrick Lamar's new album I really love I follow a lot of rap for that reason mostly because they the ones that really have the flow it's the same thing we need to have a flow too but our flow is in goes with the music because of, of what I was saying before because of the nature of, and the history of this music we as vocalists were you know really deeply entrenched in the musical thing but aside from that there's not a lot of difference in my opinion 
you um I was taking a look at some of the uh, social media resources, I guess you would say, it available for you, and there was an interesting picture. It's you and Clint Eastwood sitting somewhere at some sort of event. What was that? Oh, yeah, that was in 2006 on Monterey Jazz Festival. Uh, Clint is a great jazz fan. He's a pretty good piano player himself. And, uh, yeah, he was shooting an interview. And uh, I think also that was at the time when um, we were um, working on this opera, little jazz opera that Dave Brubeck wrote mm, right. and I was playing the the main uh, female character who was Canary Row from a subject of uh, John Steinbeck and that's where it was debuted there at Monterey uh, commissioned to be played there or something like yes, that yes yes it was it was it was commissioned to be premiered at Monterey and Clint did uh, you know a whole series of uh, of um, shootings for that and also for um, he was also shooting another documentary on j great jazz pianists. And so he shot uh, Hank Jones, and I was there playing with Hank Jones. So Hank Jones was a great player who was Ella Fitzgerald's piano player for many years, for those who are not too familiar with, with this name, but one of the greatest of all times, you know, Hank Jones. Yeah, so Clint is, is really into He's a very knowledgeable about jazz. And he has a house on Maui, and he listens to our station. He actually donated a Mercedes Benz to our radio station for because we're a nonprofit for our pledge drive. So I'm familiar with his passions for. Uh, he's, a, he's a great supporter of the music. Really, really great. I'm so grateful for all, yeah. all he's done. So. No, he is legendary with that. I figured that would be the uh, occasion. As we go to wrap it up, uh, how often are you in Italy these days? Well, not as often as I would like to, <laughs> I have to tell you, but um, maybe two or three times a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Turin, st Torino, still where uh, your, your family live? Yes, yes. My mom and dad and uh, the rest of my family are in Torino, yeah. Other passions that, you're, that you have besides music, anything equally as passionate? Uh, it seems like this, as we were talking about in the beginning, your whole life from the time you were young, you're exposed to this stuff, critical exposure, mother, father, the places they took you, then you see the development you have. you have anything else you care about equally, or is this thing just front and center? Yes, in general, the arts, but I love to read literature, and that's a big thing. I read all the time, but I also love dance. Um, uh, and and visual arts, you know, everything that's art, I am very attracted to, and and you know, I go the theater, for example, acting is another. Big, but there's again, it's arts. It's all one thing, really. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And a final question: uh, You've worked with a lot of people. Um, you like a lot of different things. Who is it when you think of folks that you have yet to cross paths with, or maybe you have crossed paths with them, and you're like, I really like to work with them one day, or they're an inspiration, and you have yet to get your opportunity to do something professional? Well, it would be uh, the great pianist Ahmad Jamal, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> You would be a Majama, really. For, I would really love to work, and um, you know a lot of things I haven't. But but I know it's it's shooting really high. But the great Stevie Wonder, for example, I love Stevie's music. Fantastic. It to me is like a jazz. Uh, it's like a jazz musician. <laughs> yeah, Benissimo, <laughs> and many many more. But you know, just dreaming. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with dreaming, and you're a very talented woman. And I'm sure that something like that. Uh, uh, it could, could be coming your way. Uh, Roberta Gamarini. And uh, did, was this, how was this for a conversation? Was keep you, how did, I, did this keep you entertained? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it was an unexpected question. Yeah, it was great. Great. And your Italian is very good. Very good. Uh, grazie. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for, for talking to us. And hopefully uh, down the road, we'll, we'll have you back on HPR. Appreciate it. Great. I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you.